All right, so today we're going to do a dissection tour, and we're going to look at body cavities, organs, and serous membranes. At our institution, we use cats, so let's go ahead and glove up and get to work. All right, so let's start in the thoracic cavity, and I'd like to draw your attention to this passageway right here. How do I know it's a passageway? Well, it's shaped like a tube. So the tube is a passageway for what? Well, let's look closely at this structure. Here we have rings of cartilage. And we have to think, form follows function. Why would we want cartilage in this pass passageway? It's to keep it open or patent. So when you're thinking this passageway needs to stay open, what is going to pass through that? Air. So that means this is the trachea. Let's look at the other passageway that's just posterior to it on a human, on a cat, we would call this superior. Okay, this passageway here is real floppy and squishy. Uh, why would we want this passageway to be floppy? Well, that means it's going to be more flexible. So what kind of passageway needs to be more flexible? The food passageway. So that means this is the esophagus. So again, form follows function. Why is this tube going to be flimsy to accommodate the various sizes of a food bolus? So when you're in lab, make sure that you're not just looking at this, that you're feeling it. The trachea is going to be pretty stiff. The esophagus is going to be a lot squishier. So be hands-on, and that's something that will help you differentiate these two passageways. Continuing on, let's look here. We have the right lung and the left lung. So remember, your rights and lefts. Oh my word, this is the easiest thing to forget in AMP. So it's always the specimen or the patient's right and left. So this would be since the uh, cat specimen is on its back, we're looking at the ventrum. So this is the right side, this is the left side. So the full credit proper answer is right lung, left lung. Of course, this right here is the heart. And then here we see uh, human terms, we would call this the superior side. On a cat, we would say this is the anterior side, but this is the diaphragm, the top of it. In order to see the underside of it, we would need to go down into the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now we are in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So the first organ I'd like to point out is this very large liver. The liver is always going to have a roommate, and that is the gallbladder. So on the cat, the gallbladder is going to look like a little deflated balloon. So that's your big clue for that. On our human torso models, make sure you flip that liver over, and the gallbladder will be better visualized on the posterior side, and um, uh, it's colored green. Additionally, we have, let's see, the stomach, which is right here. Okay, so this is the stomach. The stomach is then going to go into the small intestine. Okay. And then we have the large intestine. So again, be hands-on in lab. When you're just learning this, make sure you compare the two tubes. You can clearly see the diameter difference. So this is going to be the small, this is going to be the large. Getting into a little bit more detail, the first part of the small intestine is going to be the duodenum. You also hear duodenum. Okay, the middle part is going to be the jejunum. And then the part that's going to be associated with the large intestine, that is the ileum. So it's the distal end or the uh, the end of the small intestine. Then we have here, it's situated as such. So we have the ascending, transverse, descending colon, which is another name for the large intestine on the cat. Okay, going back up here, this very dark structure this is the spleen, and the spleen is often this very dark color 
or maybe kind of a darkish brown. That's how you can tell it apart. It's very close to the stomach, so that's a good clue. And then probably the most challenging organ to find on the cat is the pancreas. Okay, so this is the pancreas right here. Oftentimes it's going to be kind of a grayish color. But a clue is that the pancreas is going to connect to the duodenum. And when we get into the digestive system, that will make more sense because the pancreas actually secretes digestive fluids into the uh, duodenum. Now let's look at this thing right here. We have some peritoneal extensions and we're going to talk about the peritoneum when we get to the serous membranes, but I just want to show you there are actually two peritoneal extensions and one of them is the greater omentum. The greater omentum is also nicknamed the fatty apron. It contains some adipose tissue, as you can see. The easiest way to tell that you're looking at the fatty apron, again, because it lies over these abdominal organs, is that it connects to, part of it at least, connects to what we call the greater curvature of the stomach. So again, that is one of the peritoneal extensions called the greater omentum. The other one is the mesentery. The mesentery is associated with the small intestine. So you just go to the small bowel and gently kind of unfold it like such. I'll mention this again when we go over the serous membranes, but that is the mesentery. Here we have the right kidney. On the other side, we have the left kidney. And those kidneys are then going to eventually connect to, via the ureters, to the urinary bladder, which is right here. Okay, let's talk serous membranes. This is definitely what I get the most questions about, and understandably so, because it's really hard to wrap our minds around how this membrane can simultaneously line a cavity wall and then create the external surface of most of the organs. So here, let's remind ourselves about how we name and identify serous membranes. Serous membranes have two names. The first name is going to tell us if it's the inner or the outer layer. The second name is going to tell us what part of the body we're looking at. So here I have kind of this crude example. Okay, I have this green paper and this blue paper and they're simply put in a sheet protector with a purpose. So here we have this blue paper. This is going to represent the parietal layer. You can also see that I've uh, noted that it is the outer layer. How do we know? Well, parietal kind of sort of sounds like perimeter, and I know that's a bit of a stretch, but hey, that's what we do in AMP, right? Um, so what's the perimeter of something? The perimeter is the outer part. So the parietal layer is going to be the outer serous membrane. It will line the cavity wall itself, okay? Then it will continue and the other side of it is going to be, which is really the inside, is going to be this visceral layer represented by my green paper. Um, the word viscera reminds us that we're talking about the organ, and this will often case be the external surface of the organ. Now, something else that's important to know is that in between the parietal and the visceral layer, we have this potential space and this potential space is filled with serous fluid, and that's a very important thing to understand. So here with this example I have, let's just pretend that this pencil cup is some kind of cavity. If I were to take this paper and line it like so, we could see that the layer that is going to line the body cavity itself is that outer layer or the parietal layer. Again, it's going to double back 
and the inside, which is really going to create the external surface of an organ, is going to be the visceral layer. So kind of the classic textbook example you'll see is an enclosed fist pushed into a water balloon. So if we just pretended that this hand were a water balloon, so inside is water, and my fist represented the organ, and we simply just kind of pushed it in so it wrapped around like this, the part of my hand which is touching the organ itself would be the visceral or the inner layer. The part that's on the outside would be the parietal layer. And again, in between the two, you would have that cavity space, which is filled with serous fluid. So hopefully those examples give you a better idea of what serous membranes are. But let's go ahead and go back to the specimen so you can see some specific examples. And I think you'll have a better understanding of what they are and how we name them. So we're back in the thoracic cavity. Let's look at the pleural serous membranes. So here I've pinned with the yellow pin this very delicate tissue. Okay, as you can see, this is clearly lining the thoracic cavity. So would that be the parietal or the visceral pleura? Well, hopefully you're saying that's the parietal because it's on the outer part, and then pleura because we're saying it's by the ribs or to the side of something. So the yellow pin is inside the parietal pleura. Here I just pin the external part of the lung. So because this is on the organ itself, you want to think of that word viscera which means the pink pin represents the visceral pleura. So parietal pleura, visceral pleura. All right, so now let's take a look at the heart. Because we're talking about the heart, we're gonna use the term pericardium. So notice that there is a sac that goes around the heart. We call that the uh, pericardial sac, um, and there are a little bit more details than what I go into right here, so I'm, I'm generalizing just a little bit here. Um, but since the sac is on the outer part, that is going to be the parietal pericardium. Now technically, if we were to get into more details in the heart chapter, you'll see that there are a couple of layers of the pericardial sac, and that parietal pericardium is actually going to make the inside portion of this. But for the purposes of just identifying it, you can say that is the parietal pericardium. And then remember when we're talking about the organ, this is going to uh, be the viscera. So we're gonna say this is the visceral pericardium. And in fact, when you get into the heart chapter and you're learning the different layers of the heart, the visceral pericardium is actually going to be synonymous with what we call the epicardium, or the outermost layer of the heart itself. So again, for the purposes of just identifying the serous membranes, when you see a pin on the sac, that's gonna represent the parietal pericardium. When you see a pin on the organ itself, just think organ, viscera, visceral pericardium. Okay, so we're in the abdominal pelvic cavity, and when we're in this cavity, we use the term peritoneum. So again, consistent with the colors I've been using, here we have the yellow pin. Clearly, this is on the wall of the abdominal cavity, and I have the pin through this serous membrane, which would be called the parietal peritoneum. Parietal because it's on the outer part, peritoneum because of where we are. So a great example of parietal peritoneum. Now visceral peritoneum, um, an example that I like to show is here on the small bowel, the small intestines. And the reason why I like to do this is because, well, number one, remember viscera reminds us of organ. So since this is on the organ itself, we think, okay, visceral and we're in the abdominal pelvic cavity, so uh, this will be the visceral peritoneum. So 
Additionally, if we were to follow this, you'll notice that that goes into the mesentery. Sometimes you'll see this mesentery proper because mesentery can be used in a more general sense for the other um, structure, the greater omentum that I showed you earlier. But it's fine if you just learn this as the mesentery for now. But if we were to follow this tissue, we would see that it continues along. And so the reason why we can see this tissue is because this is uh, double walled, meaning on this side of the intestine, it goes across. And if we were to flip this over, this side also goes. And so the two layers come together and that's what creates that really nice mesentery proper. So again, for the serous membranes, the yellow is going to be the parietal peritoneum. The pink pin represents the visceral peritoneum. All right, what are retroperitoneal organs? Well, we identified this as the parietal peritoneum. That term retro means behind. So a retroperitoneal organ is an organ that lies behind the peritoneum. So if we were to look at the left kidney, the kidneys are one example, probably the more, more well-known example of a retroperitoneal organ. You'll see that this parietal peritoneum comes up and then covers the human term anterior side of the kidney. That's what makes it retroperitoneal. There are other organs as well and parts of other organs that are retroperitoneal. But when you see that term, just know that this parietal peritoneum is going to come up over the anterior side of that organ. The last thing I want to show you guys is the uh, diaphragm. And the diaphragm is very important because it separates the thoracic from the abdominopelvic cavities. So here on the superior side, again, I'm using human terms, the superior surface of the diaphragm is actually covered by parietal pleura. So this serous membrane that we looked at just a minute ago is gonna come down and then it is continuous with the top side of the superior side of the diaphragm. It's separate from the parietal pericardium. The parietal pericardium just kind of touches it, uh, but then it's actually parietal pleura that covers this. On the inferior side of that dome-shaped diaphragm, it's actually going to be parietal peritoneum that covers this part. So again, why is this important apart from um, us depending on it very much so to breathe? Well, it's because it separates the two cavities, the thoracic from the abdominopelvic cavity. And depending on what side you're looking at, we will actually have a different serous membrane. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Please hit like and subscribe. And don't forget to check out my Instagram page, at The Anatomy Gal. See you next time. You have something in your nose.